Okay, so this month we're going to talk about dependency injection, and we're going to talk about it generally first, and then we're going to look at a an open source library that uh, allows you to implement dependency injection in a uh, large scale. So dependency injection comes up in the context of the so-called solid object-oriented design principles, uh, single responsibility principle, open closed principle, Liskov substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency injection comes in with the dependency inversion principle. Let's take a look at these real quick. So single responsibility is just a class should have a single responsibility. And uh, the biggest sign that you're not doing this is you have a so-called God class that does everything in your application and it has many methods and uh, the methods are not um, coherent in the sense that they all serve a single purpose. There's multiple purposes being served by the interface of a single class. And the idea here is if we change only one aspect of the software specification, then it should only affect uh, the specification of a single class. Uh, open closed principle, this is one that um, it, it makes sense when you think about it, but in terms of its name, it's not so easy to, uh, you know, kind of jump to the front of your mind when you think about it. And it's because it has kind of a weird description, the description being classes should be open for extension, but closed for modification. And the best way to think of it is if I need to extend a class, I should be able to do that without having to modify the source code of the class. So that means, um, for instance, I might just need to subclass it, or uh, maybe I can extend the behavior by supplying new implementations of interfaces to, as arguments to the methods on the class, or, and so on. Uh, Liskov substitution principle, this is just the idea that an interface represents a contract. And so uh, objects in a program should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of the program. What that means is if I have a base class and it provides an interface, that the requirements are not just the syntactical requirements of the interface, but there's semantic requirements of what that interface means as well. And the good example I always use of this is while in geometry, all squares are rectangles, a square class should not derive from rectangle. And that's because a square class cannot support the semantics of a rectangle. A rectangle has a width and a height that are independently settable. Whereas in a square, the width and the height have to remain the same. So they can't be set independently. Changing the width of a square changes the height of the square, but that's not true for a rectangle. So a square class should not derive from a rectangle class, even though in mathematics, all squares are rectangles. So that um, represents an is a relationship. And you might think that that implies a class hierarchy, but a square can't maintain the invariance of a rectangle, which is that the width and the height of a rectangle can be changed independently. Interface segregation principle, this is just the idea that you shouldn't have really fat interfaces. You should have small interfaces. And uh, the idea here is if you have a class and um, clients of that class don't use all the interface, don't use all the methods on the interface of that class, then it probably is implying that there's multiple smaller, simpler interfaces that are hiding in that larger interface. And you, you can fix it by splitting larger interfaces into smaller, more specific ones. And then finally, dependency inversion principle, which is what we're going to talk about today. The idea here is uh, high-level modules should depend should not depend on low-level modules directly. Both should depend on abstractions. And abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. And we'll, you know, we'll look at what this means a little bit more in a second. Um, but the idea here is implementations should be coupled to abstractions. 
So if I have a class that collaborates with the second class, it should collaborate with that second class through an abstraction. And it further means that we shouldn't have uh, we shouldn't have to change our abstractions just because some implementation detail uh, changed. And this is the idea of abstractions not depending on details. So you, can, you can view it as abstractions should not depend on concrete classes. Um, and we're talking about, and we're, um, in this case, we're talking about classes that represent behavior as opposed to value types. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this in a more clearly here. So in practice, the dependency inversion principle means that concrete classes are coupled to interfaces, which in C++ is a pure virtual base class or a pure virtual class. And we use interfaces for classes that represent behavior, in other words, collaborators. Um, and this is an interesting thing in C++ because if all you ever saw was all the stuff in the standard library, you don't see classes like this. The standard library doesn't have any, uh, to my, I can't think of any instances. There might be something buried down in uh, the uh, locale library, which I'm not a big expert on. I'm familiar with it, but I'm not an expert on it. But by and large, the classes in the standard library are concrete value type classes. So think of something like string. String doesn't have any polymorphic behavior. A string is a string is a string. It's a complete concrete type. It is. It has some static polymorphism because it's a templated class, but it doesn't have any runtime polymorphism. Um, static polymorphism is just another way of saying it has the ability to be instantiated for different types that meet the requirements of the template arguments so the character type for std string the std string is really just a type def for std basic string of care and std w string is std basic string of w care t and so on so all the classes in the standard library, they're, they're really value types. Uh, you instantiate them as values. You, they're not intended to be the base class that you derive from. If you need to provide a new type that is some kind of specialized vector, for instance, you should hold the vector as a member in your class and expose all the necessary operations on your class and delegate to the held vector. Uh, this is just the old advice of preferring aggregation over inheritance. Inheritance is the strictest kind or, or the uh, tightest kind of coupling that you can have between two classes. Whereas if I use aggregation instead of inheritance, then um, if I decide to switch my storage from std vector to uh, std deck or something like that, um, strictly speaking, that shouldn't show up in clients of my class. Uh, due to the way header files work, it probably means you're going to have to recompile, but it's just due to the way the implementation details are exposed in a class declaration in C++, unless you use a pimple mechanism or something like that. Um, so when we think of pure virtual classes, we don't have examples of class hierarchies of interfaces, pure virtual classes in the standard library. So it's hard to see um, examples of this idiom that are considered um, you know, best practice and therefore shown in the standard library, or um, there's some mention of it in the C++ guidelines in terms of uh, practices with respect to pure virtual classes, but there's not really a canonical example for you to imitate. So it can be you know, a little bit confusing Fusing or a little bit difficult to, to find your way towards best practices when uh, structuring your code to handle the dependency inversion principle. But what it really comes down to is that your collaborators, these are the classes that, um, so if you, have, if you have two classes, one collaborates with the other, the, the client of the collaborator interacts with the collaborator through a pure virtual interface and uh, holds a pointer or reference to the collaborator that is set up as a member variable. Um, 
and this connecting of concrete classes to interfaces decouples the implementation of the two classes. So the, collab the collaborator implements the interface. So the only reason the collaborator needs to be recompiled is if you change the implementation of the collaborator or the signature of any of the methods on the interface or, or the interface itself, you add or remove methods, rename methods. That's the only time the implementation needs to be recompiled. Clients of the collaborator only need to be recompiled when the interface changes. So if the collaborator gets an implementation detail change, the only thing that needs to be recompiled is the collaborator, not all the clients of the interface, because the, the pure virtual class disconnects the clients from the implementation details. So that's what we want. When we said a second ago, abstractions should not depend on details and details should depend on abstractions. The client depends on the abstraction, which is the pure virtual interface. And that pure virtual interface in turn does not depend on any implementation detail. It, it, may only de it may depend on other abstractions. You may have a hierarchy of interfaces, or it may, that interface may take, have methods that take um, references or pointers to other interfaces as arguments, but itself does not depend on implementation details. So coupling implementations to interfaces gives us, uh, you might have heard of it as a compiler firewall. Um, and this is because we're depending on the abstraction. So when the implementation changes, it provides a compiler firewall. It doesn't require all the clients of that interface to change. The other thing that it gives us is by depending on abstractions, it gives us more opportunities for strict unit testing by supplying mock implementations of the collaborator to the client that we want to test. So the client will interact with the collaborator through the interface. The implementation we supply at unit testing time is a mock object. So we can monitor and configure the mock object to understand whether our client interacted correctly under all circumstances. And that gives us the opportunity to do strict unit testing, which uh, unlike integration testing, strict unit tests are simpler to write and quicker, much quicker to execute. They can execute in, you know, a millisecond or less. A millisecond might even be considered a long C++ unit test. Um, however, this does mean in practice that we have to separate object construction from business logic. So if you have a constructor and it is newing up your collaborators in the constructor, that means I can't, I, I'm not doing dependency injection. I'm not doing dependency inversion because I'm not supplying the dependencies. I am coupled directly to the implementation of the dependency because I am constructing the object that is the implementation explicitly in my constructor. So we have to separate out object construction from business logic. Now, um, let's go into this a little bit in more detail. So if we separate object construction from object consumers, then we're not constructing objects, we're not constructing our collaborators in the constructor of a class, we're accepting those through this, the constructor as arguments to the constructor. And when we do this, then changing the implementation of the uh, interface doesn't require all the clients to be recompiled. Now, even if I were only interacting with the collaborator through the interface, so my member object was an interface, if I'm still constructing the concrete implementation of my collaborator in my client's constructor, I'm still coupled to the header file for the implementation. So I, ha I don't have a complete compiler firewall yet. But if I take the object construction out of the client and I inject it by interface as an argument to the constructor on the client, 
now I can completely separate myself from the implementation of the interface. Um, the only time you would need to recompile clients is when the public interface has any kind of change to it. And if you've ever used a, a, an SDK where it is uh, providing objects in some kind of class hierarchy, so it's a C++ API in an SDK, um, the way that you achieve stability for customers of your SDK is to have your customers coupled only to your abstract interfaces. And uh, at the beginning of the client interacting with your SDK, it probably is calling some kind of factory function to get a base interface from which they can then get all the other objects that they need, or maybe you have multiple factory functions. But the, the factory functions hide the details of what concrete class implements the abstraction that's returned by the factory. And if you've ever done any Windows COM programming, this is how they enforce that explicitly. You can only reference objects through a pure virtual interface. You can never reference uh, objects through their implementation. You don't, you don't even know what language it's implemented in. You might be calling it from C++. It could be implemented in Delphi object-oriented Pascal, or it could be implemented in Visual Basic. It could be implemented in C Sharp. From your perspective, all you know is I have a abstract interface that represents the methods that this object um, implements in terms of the semantics of the interface. And your factory function is a system provided function in the COM API called co-create instance. That's how you get the first interface. And from that interface, you can either use factory methods on that interface to get more objects, or you can co-create instance use the com factory function to get more instances of more interfaces. Now, um, it's very interesting to study com from an architectural perspective, especially if you are considering shipping some kind of SDK where people can access your um, implementation in a stable manner. Um, I've worked on code that had SDKs that exposed concrete implementations and SDKs that exposed only interfaces. And although you can achieve binary compatibility with, with an SDK that exposes concrete classes, it is much more difficult as the code changes over time, especially if you have to do things like you, you have to add um, functionality to your implementation and that involves adding new virtual methods or removing virtual methods or renaming a virtual method. Anything to do with a virtual method change tends to ripple its way out and interact with binary compatibility, so-called the ABI of your SDK, the application binary interface of your SDK. And it can become very torturous to try and evolve your code and make changes while maintaining that binary compatibility when the clients are coupled directly to implementation classes. If they are coupled to interfaces, you have so much more freedom to clean up your code, restructure your code, and all you need to do is maintain the interface contract. So there are examples of doing this for decades. I mean, COM came out in the 90s, I think the, you know, like 91 or 92, so it's getting on 30 years old at this point. So there are um, lots of stuff written about COM and how they achieve that binary compatibility. So if you're in the business of providing any kind of SDK or you're looking to provide some kind of plug-in capability to your application, you should really look at the issues that are addressed in the design of COM um, un unless it's just like a couple functions, you know, and or maybe you don't care about binary compatibility because all your clients, you can just tell them every time there's a new SDK, you have to recompile. But for a plugin type scenario, users tend to want their old plugins to stay working with new versions of the application. So binary compatibility is a, an important thing. So dependency inversion gives you cleaner code because you've got details coupled to abstractions instead of other details. So there's less churn through your build system whenever you make changes. 
gives you the ability to do more strict unit testing to give you confidence in the code changes that you're making. And it can give you binary compatibility in situations where you might require that through some kind of an SDK or plugin model. Now, it's easy to construct a few objects by hand and wire them into arguments to the constructors. Once it gets to medium size, you can still do it by hand. It's, it's doable, but it starts getting old pretty quick. But if we're talking thousands of objects or hundreds of types of interfaces, you know, constructing this whole thing by hand can be really painful. So can we use some kind of library to assist in, in object construction? And, and obviously from the description of this talk, the answer is yes, we're going to look at one. But here's some things to think about when we look at uh, dependency injection libraries. Uh, the one we're going to look at is not the only one. There are a bunch out there. Um, do we have to register each constructible type manually? Um, this could be really tedious for hundreds of types. If we're introducing dependency injection into our application, not from the beginning, but at a later stage, um, ha having to register all these types manually could be really annoying if there's uh, hundreds or thousands of types even though we uh, the incremental burden is not that much the initial buy-in could you know is quite large so that is something we want to keep an eye on um now we know that there are tricks with templates that can be used to deduce the arguments of functions so is it possible that we can use type deduction so that the library would just figure out what types need to be constructed in order to make an instance of an uh, implementation class and follow that chain recursively so that everything that's necessary can just be constructed on demand by the dependency injection library. That would be nice because it would just mean that we would go to the uh, dependency injection library and just say, give me one of these, uh, give me a foo. And it says, oh, to make a foo, I need a bar. To make a bar, I need a, a was. So let me make the was, and then I'll make the bar, and then I can make the foo, and I'll give you back the foo. And it didn't require me to know that a foo required a bar and a bar required a was. I didn't need to know the dependency chain of uh, construction. Um, there's also value type arguments to constructors. You know, we might have an integer parameter that's, you know, the line length of some logging component. And if the lines that are logged are longer than that length, then it splits them into multiple lines or something. Um, how do we get to specify those kinds of values to constructors? Um, and how do we do things like, I might have multiple implementations of the same interface. For instance, uh, a very common way to implement strategy pattern is to have a, an interface that represents the uh, requirements say for instance we have different ways of sorting items in a list and there are different implementations of the sort algorithm our sort interface and you know one of them sorts by first name one of them sorts by last name another one sorts by social security number whatever if these are like employee records in a in a you know personnel management system so we need to be able to supply different implementations of the same interface and be able to select the appropriate one at the appropriate time. Uh, we might need to choose one of several implementations. Uh, we might need to have um, a set of instances of an, of an interface where they are different implementations and I need to have them um, all of all of the instances of that in, of that interface, I need to have them all available simultaneously, as opposed to just picking one of n. So these are these are all things we want to think about when looking at a dependency injection library, because we're going to turn over all object creation to this. Uh, well, we're going to turn over all the object creation tasks for all of our behavioral objects to the dependency injection library. Um, so this brings us to, we, we mentioned uh, 
we might have to deal with value type arguments like integer. And if we're using type inference to select the objects that are con that are supplied to constructor to the to a constructor um if i have a constructor for a button that takes two ints you know which int should get which value and how do i tell my dependency injection library uh which values it should supply and this is related to something called primitive obsession code smell and this is um, the idea of using primitive da data types to represent domain ideas. So in our fictitious example here of a constructor for a button, it takes two ints and it's like, what do those two ints mean? Well, we have to go look at the documentation or maybe we uh, have a little pop-up that says, you know, the name of the first argument is width and the name of the second argument is height. So that tells us as human beings what those two arguments mean, but the computer still has no idea. It can't distinguish by argument name. It can only distinguish by types. And so it's just saying, I don't know, there's two ints here. Uh, they could be the same thing. They could be different things. We don't really know. But if we introduce domain types for those concepts of a width and a height, this in this case, it's a, it's a button object and some kind of GUI framework that you might imagine. So width and height are domain concepts in that GUI framework that are gonna be ubiquitous across all these user interface elements. I don't wanna ever confuse a width with a height. So having them be distinct types makes it impossible for me to use them incorrectly. I can't supply a height value to a width argument and I can't supply a width value to a height argument. Now they have to be actual distinct types. They can't just be type defs because a type def is just a type alias. It's just an another name for the same underlying type. So if I used a plain type def and said, you know, type def int width, well, then I can write the declaration using the type def, but as far as the compiler is concerned, it's still just an int. But if we introduce distinct domain value types, we can eliminate the ambiguity. Uh, it also gives us possibility of asserting some kind of domain value integrity inside these domain types. Um, this idiom of using a um, domain type instead of a primitive in C++, there's a, this name, the strong type def is the name for this idiom. Let's take a look at that. So if we just make a simple wrapper class that is constructible from and convertible to the underlying value, in this case, it's an int, then when we construct a button, we can explicitly say the width type initialized from 40. So that is invoking the constructor of our width value type class, initializing the little member variable to 40 and our height similarly with 10. And the button constructor takes a width argument and then a height argument. So now when we look at how this button is constructed, we can easily see, oh, this is a button that is a width of 40 and a height of 10, whatever those units are. The pixels could be, you know, point, like a font point size, could be in points, could be, you know, centimeters, whatever. You, you can go further and uh, introduce some kind of units library to say it's 40 pixels or 40 centimeters or what, what have you. Um, Writing these little wrapper classes gets old and there's a header in the boost serialization library called strong type def that lets you do this in a single line. So in this case, the width and height are constructible from and convertible to int. And if we had other primitive types like std string or float or double or unsigned int or short care, whatever we want to use as the base type, we could do that with boost strong type def. So strong type defs are a way to get rid of the primitive obsession code smell. The primitive obsession code smell gives us, or sorry, strong type defs gives us a way to supply distinct types for the different semantics of the input arguments to our constructors that don't represent
interfaces that represent concrete values. So we can use that with a library that uses type deduction to supply um, values to our dependency injection library in a way that matches up the right values to the right arguments in a constructor. So the library we're going to look at is boost.di. This is um, not officially a part of boost. Um, clearly, the intention of the authors is to have it be a part of boost, but it is not officially a part yet. It is a single file header only library, uh, requires C14. It does have real world, world clients that use the library. The It's open source on GitHub. And we're going to now we're going to take a look at the documentation for it. Um, because then I don't have to repeat all the information that they have in their examples and slides. So this is just a recap of what uh, we just discussed with dependency injection. So you see here on the left, they have a class that does not use dependency injection. It is... Um, constructing the collaborators explicitly in the member field initializers of the class. And then it is using those collaborators in a method on the coffee maker, the brew method. Whereas over here, we are injecting the collaborators as arguments to the constructor, using those injected arguments to initialize the member field, member fields of the class, and then using the collaborators in the brew method as before. The difference is that instead of constructing the collaborators explicitly, as they've done on the left, the abstraction is injected into the class in the constructor arguments. So you may already be doing this to a certain extent in your code. Um, so that if, you, if you're already coding in that style where are, you're already injecting collaborators directly into the constructors of your objects, then you're, you're close to using a dependency injection framework. If you're, if you're doing code more like on the left, you can see it's not a big refactor to go from what's on the left to on the right to get your code um, decoupled from implementations and coupled to abstractions so that you can use a dependency injection framework. So they point out here that there's a, a couple uh, poor practices um, with respect to dependency injection. In, in, and from now on, when I say dependency injection, it's just going to mean arguments to constructors on a C++ class. So they say, you know, one common mistake is passing a dependency to create another dependency inside your object. And their example here is that these are the arguments used to construct the implementation of a, a board class that implements the interface. So their, all their behavior is coupled to the interface, but their constructor is still making the implementation explicitly. So as they suggest, it's better to refactor this to just take the interface and um, in this case, it's a, it's a unique pointer which is not copyable. So they're using std move to initialize the member variable from the, uh, to, to steal it from the value that was passed into the constructor. Um, another thing is they talk about, you know, carrying dependencies. And the idea here is that, um, Instead of coupling yourself to a static method on a class, you want to connect yourself to interface methods because uh, static methods is just another way of coupling you to a concrete implementation. So it's it, again, it is not c connecting yourself to an abstraction, it's connecting yourself to a detail. So um, they replace this static method call with an instance method call. Uh, and um, it looks like also they, they switched it from they were 
it's weird. I think this might be just a documentation bug. They called this service and then they, they moved it from an I board. But I think what they really mean is that it should be uh, a service interface. At any rate, um, the thing to notice here is if you couple yourself to static methods, you are coupling yourself to an implementation detail. You are connecting yourself not to an abstraction, but you are connecting yourself to an in, uh, a detail. So couple yourself through interfaces, not through static methods, which is really just another way of naming a concrete function. Um, there's also this uh, carrying the injector or the service locator pattern. So the idea of a service locator is an interface where you say, you ask the service locator for another interface. So here, what they really wanted was a way to obtain the service interface. So they accepted a service locator and they asked the service locator to give them an instance of the service interface. And the better thing to do is just pass the service interface directly. Now, there's a competing force here. And when I say force, I'm talking about a design force. So there are different design forces that are interacting with your code. Here we're trying to do dependency injection. So we want our collaborators to be injected as arguments. What if I have a class that for some reason has many collaborators? That leads to long argument list smell. I'd have to inject all the collaborators as individual arguments to my constructor. Now, we mentioned earlier that uh, in the beginning that one of the solid principles is interface, se interface segregation principle. So if you have many collaborators, it might just mean that the class that's interacting with those many collaborators doesn't have a well segregated interface. And that's why it needs so many collaborators. Another possibility might be that you are, uh, excuse me, you might be violating law of Demeter. So um, the law of Demeter is um, don't get an object from your collaborator and then tell the collaborator's collaborator to do something. Only collaborate with your, you know, immediate, um, only call methods on your immediate collaborators is the way to think of it. So it could be the reason that you have many collaborators being injected is because some of those are collaborators of collaborators that you already have passed to you and you eliminated the daisy chain of method calls by just passing in the collaborators separately. It might be um, better to refactor that code to have fewer collaborators and have them delegate to the secondary objects that need to get things done. It, it's hard to say which is the better case without looking at specific code. But you can see that if we replace the service locator with the direct interface, that if we were asking for many collaborators from the service locator, that this argument list could get quite long when all those collaborators are injected explicitly. So you have competing design forces interacting on your code, and uh, it may be um, indicating that there's, there's more work to do. I mean, just because you make the parameter list long now doesn't mean it has to stay that way forever. You may make a note to yourself to see if there's a better design that results in a shorter number of collaborators being injected into your constructor that you can get to later. But for now, your goal is to get your code switched over to dependency injection. So we're going to inject the collaborators. Um, and then this not using strong type desk for constructor parameters, we just discussed the primitive obsession code smell and how we can use strong type defs to make those different int arguments distinguishable. So, um, you know, do you need dependency injection? Well, dependency injection gives you more loosely coupled code. Why is loosely coupled code better? Loosely coupled code is better because it gives you the freedom to change implementation details without as long as you're adhering to the same semantics, 
of the implementation's interface, then you can change the implementation and be confident that it's not going to ripple through your system. And so loosely coupled code gives you designs that are more flexible because they can be improved in one area without having to make a massive edit rippling through the entire system. And loosely coupled code gives you more opportunities for introducing new functionality because uh, the coupling to abstractions instead of implementation details leads to um, code that can be more readily combined in new forms because you can combine the abstractions in a new manner and without having to go and change a bunch of implementations because it, I can't tell you how often it is easy to just quickly hack something up between two collaborators because the two collaborators happen to know about each other's implementation. Whereas if I'd had an abstract interface separating these two collaborators, I would have had to think more carefully about, oh, I can't just, you know, hack that in because it there's no way to communicate that across this abstraction. Does that mean my abstraction is missing something? And then I enhance my abstraction and um, improve it for the whole system instead of taking these two things that already happen to know about each other's implementation and then intertwining them even further, making it even harder to separate them apart. Um, and those, you know, dependency injection from making it easier to maintain code, I think you can see just from the examples we were discussing how that can be. And making it easier to test code is probably the biggest advantage you will get from dependency injection. It is so nice to be able to test a class in isolation and know that you've decoupled it from all the externalities outside the control of that class. And by decoupling it through dependency injection, it gives you the ability to, uh, I need to fix a bug in this class. So I write a test. The test fails because the test reproduces the bug scenario. I go fix the bug in the implementation. I run the test again. The test now passes. That was previously failing because it, it represented this bug scenario. I run all the other tests I have on that class. And that class now has, I have confidence that not only did I fix the bug, but I didn't break anything else in terms of the strict unit behavior of that class. Those tests are really quick to run so I can run them every time I edit compile. And I can then further, after having getting all those, uh, my new tests and make to pass and my existing tests stay passing. Once I've done that, I can do an integration test, bring the whole system together. And that integration test make, can be lengthy but I'm, I'm doing it infrequently. So my inner loop of my edit compile test cycle is running unit strict unit tests where the system under test is collaborating only with mocks. So it is completely decoupled from any other class implementation. And those tests run in milliseconds. And if I structure my build correctly, I can get it to build in under a second. Uh, edit, you know, compile and link in under a second, run the tests in milliseconds. So I have an extremely quick edit test resume cycle that makes me very productive as a developer. So that's the biggest advantage I think you get from dependency injection is it enables very rapid feedback through test-driven development. Um, that's not to say you can't find advantages from dependency injection, even if you're not doing test-driven development. I've worked on more than one uh, large software system where there was a series of services that had to be constructed in a specific order because they had uh, dependencies on each other. And if you constructed them in the wrong order, then um, one of the classes would be constructed with a null pointer in one of its members because it tried to get the pointer to a service that hadn't been constructed yet. And if you can you construct them in the wrong order and then things may seem fine for a while until you happen to exercise the part of the system that ends up dereferencing that null pointer member variable, and then you have a crash. Now you have to debug it. And it could be that the point where the crash is discovered could happen weeks, months, maybe even years, depending on how frequently that code is executed and 
typical scenarios or in your automated testing scenarios, because you do have automated testing scenarios, right? So it could be a long time between when you make that mistake because you constructed the services in the wrong order versus when you found out. Whereas if you used a dependency injection framework, the dependency injection framework tracks the necessary uh, strict ordering of the services as they depend on each other and can guarantee that they're always constructed with all their dependencies fully created before the service and is making sure that a service is never created before its dependencies are created. Um, so here is a little example of them doing dependency injection manually. So they're creating instances of their base objects manually. Then they create a client of those that using those based objects. Here's another client that the, this first client was a view that used the renderer and the logger. Then they constructed a model that depended on the logger. And then you have a controller that depends on the model and the view and the logger. We have a user that depends on the logger and then finally an application that depends on the controller and the user object. And this is where they are pointing out that the order in which these DAR dependencies are cre created is important. And um, if we change any of the signatures of the arguments to any of the constructors of these objects, uh, either we add a new uh, dependency or we uh, change the order of the arguments, in the constructor list, a constructor argument list, or we remove one, then this code has to be modified. So any change in the signature of a constructor of any one of these classes requires us to come and modify this code. Now, um, if we use a dependency injection framework, we're just going to say, give me an app. We'll see what this looks like in a minute. And then it says, oh, to make an app, I need a controller. To make a controller, I need a model. To make a model, I need a logger. So let me make a logger. Now I can make a model. What else do I need for a controller? I need a view. To make a view, I need a renderer. OK, let's go make a renderer. I already have a logger, so now I can make the view. So now I've got the model and the view, and I already had a logger because I needed to create it transitively for these other objects. So now I can make a controller. So now I have the controller for the app. Oh, I need a user. How do I need to get a user? I can make a user from a logger. So now I have a controller and a user, and now I can make the app and I can give that back to you. So a good library can uh, use uh, type deduction and figure all that out for us and just give us back the app. So um, one thing I do like about this library is they do have some real world clients uh, that use this library. Um, and that's always a good thing because it means that um, this is not just a uh, kind of an ivory tower project that somebody thought was a good idea, but it's it's something that people outside the uh, authors of this library have been creating. So let's go take a look at um, the tutorial here. So we just get a sense for this. So here is their example of a controller that's taking some configuration and they're creating the concrete uh, model class from the configuration. And they, uh... oh, it's interesting. They're missing the config argument here in their little example. So they construct a controller and then they run it. Um, Manu if they do manual dependency injection, they would create the model and then create the controller from the model and then do run on the controller. If they're here, they're talking about using strong type defs. It's repeating some of this. I'm not just looking at the same. OK. So. Um, I was just wondering if I was looking at the same documentation page we were just looking at. No, this is a different one. So if they were uh, going to do this with Booth's uh, DI, uh, it's a single header. So they can just include di.hppp, di.hppp, hpp. And um, it's a nested namespace inside Boost. So they just gave a namespace alias here so they can do that, refer to it more concisely.
And here's the usual approach. And then here's the approach with DI. They just say, make injector, create app. And this is after they've done a using namespace DI. So what have they done here? Well, they've used this make injector to get an instance of their um, dependency injector factory, the thing that can create instances of other classes. Now they've called a template method on that class, this template method create, and supplied the type of the desired object to be created as a template argument. This is how they can use template deduction, te or uh, type deduction rather, on the requested uh, class. So they can go back and use type deduction to get back to, where was their app? So they can get back to the constructor of app to see that app takes either a, um, yeah, so that the app takes the controller. So then they can use template deduction on the constructor of the controller to see that controller needs a model. They can then instantiate the model. They can then instant using the instance of the model, they can instantiate a controller and using the instance of the controller, they can instantiate the app and then they can return that to you. So if that seems a little bit magical, it's just using the power of type deduction that comes with templates. So um, now in this case, the arguments to the constructor were references to concrete classes. So all those concrete classes had constructor members that could be ferreted out by boost DI. And uh, there's a little table here where they're showing whatever the type is for the argument to the constructor, whether or not it is allowed by boost DI, all the ones in this table are allowed. And then they have some notes over here that when it is a raw pointer or a, a pointer to a const type const t that this represents the the raw pointer uh, is assumed to be owned by um, the injector. So the injector, this make injector. When you when the argument to the constructor is a T star, the injector will new up an instance of T, hold it in the injector, and uh, take ownership of that single. Um, well, I think I'm doing it backwards. I believe it news up an instance and passes it to the constructor, and it is assumed that the constructor takes ownership of the T star. So that's why they're saying ownership transfer. When it's a reference, then um, the ownership of the singleton is within the injector class. Otherwise, these others, uh, you know, like a unique pointer and shared pointer, the ownership semantics are associated with the the smart pointer wrapper. Now, this is just the default. Um, so here's their full example where they have, here's a renderer that just is a, uh, just has a, a, a struct with an int inside. A view is constructed from a string and a reference to the renderer. The model is just an empty struct that doesn't have any constructor arguments. Sorry, it's an empty class. The controller takes a model and a view. The user is again, an empty class. And the app takes a controller and a user so they replace this manual wiring up of the object dependency stack by calling make injector to get the uh, injector class support that comes from the dependency injection library and calling the templated member function create to create this app. So notice what was nice is, um, first of all, we didn't need to register the constructors of all our classes with the dependency injection framework, we just needed to, to have the declarations be visible. And secondly, we no longer needed to remember 
the exact sequence in which things needed to be created in order to satisfy the dependency relationship. And we didn't need to um, initialize or create any of these intermediate variables whose only purpose is to get the necessary arguments into the constructor for our app. So if I refactor any of these classes, change any of their um, constructor arguments or you know add new dependencies, whatnot, as long as all the declarations for all the dependencies are visible to the injector class at the time that we are requesting the app instance, then it's good. Now, um, this is a simple example where you, what you might have noticed is we didn't have, uh, here they had a value type for a string and we didn't specify explicitly what the value of that string is. So it got an empty string because I can always make a string from nothing and, and it's just an empty string. So it figured out how to do that because, um, you know, std string is just constructible with no arguments. So it constructed one. The wrinkle starts to come in when you have um, constructor parameters where you need to supply a value. So in this case, they have uh, the, the GUI view, view takes a constructor parameter while the text view does not. So the text view is just can be constructed. It implements the iView interface and it can be constructed from the compiler supplied default constructor. Whereas the GUI view takes um, a title and a renderer argument. So we have to somehow um, specify which one we're going to use. So what they've done here is the example compile error you would get if you attempted to create an app without telling it any more information about how to select the appropriate instance of the view interface. And we can see in here it's saying the abstract type I view is not bound. Uh, so we forgot to tell it which of the concrete implementations of this I view interface that it should use to satisfy the requirement for the app. So they don't show it exactly there, but it's in the full example that the app is now dependent on an I view. So when you make the injector, you can bind an interface to a concrete class implementation. And um, it's pretty straightforward to say bind a type to uh, a concrete. In this case, it's, it's bound to a concrete class. Here you can bind it to a specific value. So we can instantiate our own specific instance of an iView implementation and say when anybody asks for an iView, give it that particular implementation. Um, so here they've said bind the iView to GUI view and bind an int to 42. So anytime a renderer is constructed, it'll be supplied with the value 42 for this int field on the renderer struct. And they're just mentioning that this whole thing, uh, because it's all done through template magic and template type deduction, that means that if any of your constructor signatures are not satisfied, you're going to find out about it at build time, not at runtime. There are other dependency injection frameworks where uh, it, you might not find out that you were missing a dependency until you attempted to instantiate the object. So here's the full example where they've got making the injector, they're binding iView to GUI view. And again, this string will be just supplied as um, a default constructed string. The renderer will be constructed with the value 42. They're asserting that at runtime in here. So uh, with this configuration of the injector, when we create the application, it supplies the necessary stuff. Now, we're going to continue here through a few more examples, but I'm not going to go through every single piece of the documentation for boost.di. The, the documentation is well written. 
uh, I think you can see from just looking here, I mean, we're looking at the tutorial. There's also a user guide and examples, and there's some examples of some extensions. But uh, let's see if we can go down more towards some more concrete, some more, some more interesting examples. We'll just go through these really quick. Uh, so that here they're showing an example of you can supply a Lambda to, to supply the appropriate implementation of an interface. So here the Lambda takes the injector as an argument and is going to return uh, an iView reference. And it uses this, um, in this case, it's just a, a scoped or global variable. And um, it's using that variable in the Lambda by reference. And it's saying like, oh, at runtime, if it's used GUI view, I'm going to call the create on the GUI view, GUI view uh, implementation of the iView interface. Otherwise, I will invoke the create with the text view implementation. So that gives you an idea of how you could have a strategy pattern in the injector to decide which implementation of an abstract interface you would select when requested as the um, argument to some other dependency. So in this case, it's going up through the app. So the app is either getting a GUI view or a text view based on the value of this Boolean variable. Um, so there's a full example for that. You can supply multiple bindings with, um, in this case, you got a controller and it's taking a vector of, cl of I clients. So you can bind a, an array of I client stars to, uh, in this case, they have a user I client and then they have another, I think this should be I client here instead of client. So this would say, when you need to make a vector of these, you're going to make a vector of user implementations that implement I client. Uh, down here, there's another example where they are binding the I client interface array. The first one is an instance of user, and the second one is an instance of timer, which both implement I client. So that's an example of I have two instances of the same interface. Sorry, yes, two instances of the same interface provided by two different implementation classes. This stuff gets kind of complicated when I talk about it verbally. Like hopefully it's more straightforward when you see the code here. Um, so you can see this, this uh, binding framework that they have is quite sophisticated and gives you lots of options. And um, here their example is um, where they're overriding some bindings and they're using um, this DI override so that um, first an integer is bound to 42 and then they override it to bind to 123. And you might do this in a scenario where you have an injector that's configured for production. So one way to, to think of this as a, a generic facility is I have an, a code that creates the injector that says, when I'm running in a production environment, these are all the implementations of all my interfaces that um, need to be specified manually some, for some reason. And I can take that injector and then apply an, uh, an override specification to it in a testing scenario to take one of my production objects and swap it out with a test double uh, or a parameter in it, a, a test double parameter. I mean, in this case, they're swapping out 123. They're overriding 42 with 123. Um, there's also gives you the ability to specify the lifetimes of the objects that are created and supplied to the constructors. Um, there is the this deduce uh, scope, which is their default, where they 
um, decide from type deduction what the lifetime is of the object that they create. There's uh, other ways to specify whether it should be a singleton or whether it should be unique, and that is unique means every time I request an instance of this type, I get a unique instance of that type. So if it were an interface pointer, I would get a unique interface pointer every time I requested that interface pointer. Uh, if it's singleton, then every time I request that interface, I get the same one after the first one. Um, and if it's instance scope, then that's where you're specifically binding it to a particular value that you're supplying. So the lifetime of the value is, is maintained by you. So that's good to know. That's pretty flexible because sometimes we have collaborators where we need them. Not that singleton is a good pattern because singleton is just global variable. I remember after all, but sometimes you have a system where there are singletons and we're going to switch to dependency injection. So we're not going to get rid of singleton. We're just going to keep using it, but I need to tell the dependency injection system that this is indeed a, a singleton and it should always be a singleton. Um, in other cases, it might um, be fine to just say, oh, it, um, you know, is a, each one can be a unique pointer T star. That's perfectly fine. Um, Let's continue on here. They have they have this little table showing the um, the type of lifetime that is used for each um, one of the different types that's deduced. This is the default, so you can switch it to something else if the default's not good enough. Um, there is also the issue of what we were discussing before the way you may have never mind just the primitive obsession uh, code smell that's going on here. Here we have two different uh, constructors and we need to and tell the dependency injection system, which one should be selected. So they have a boost DI inject macro that you can put around your constructor that should be selected by the injector. So I'm not sure what they're doing under the covers to implement that. Um, obviously, it's some kind of annotation on the method declaration here. They might be using an attribute, um, which might be why it's C++14. Um, but I'm not, I'm not entirely certain. It could insert some arbitrary stuff here into your class. This is a little bit annoying because it's intrusive into your your class's header file. Um, but as we saw earlier, you can always supply a Lambda function to um, decide which is created so you can deal with it that way. Uh, or you can bind to a specific value and deal with it that way. So it's not the, you're not required to use this boost DI inject to tell the injection framework that this is the constructor that should be selected for injection. You can deal with it in other ways, but if you want to use all the automatic machinery, then you can use that macro to annotate the right constructor to select from an overload set. And it, here, it, it, the reason you, you might wonder like, you know, why does it need to be that way? And it's because an int can be implicitly converted to a double. So sometimes those situations with uh, type deduction, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, so they're just giving you an annotation to allow you to explicitly say which one should be used. And so here's their full example. They've got the macro used here. They're also um, using named arguments. Uh, they're doing named arguments by just doing a little, um, so when you, when you write, the thing on the right side of the, of the assignment operator is a lambda. And it's guaranteed that each lambda that you write has a distinct type, even though these two lambdas have the same operational semantics. When I invoke the lambda, the same thing happens in both of these. 
but they're guaranteed to be distinct types. So even though it's the same text, this rows is of some compiler slash implementation defined type that is guaranteed to be distinct from this type of this thing called calls. So they're using that type distinction to provide another annotation to give you named arguments to your constructor. And they're binding those named arguments to values down here in the injector. So pretty fancy stuff from the point of view of an implementation, but not difficult to understand and use from the point of view of a consumer of this library. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to wrap it up because there's more details in here on this library, but all the details come down to I have a sticky object construction scenario where I have to differentiate either arguments to the constructor or selection between different implementations of a collaborating interface. And I need to do that in such a way that it get, you know, with it, that I can pick the right one with the minimum amount of fuss. And all of the um, facilities inside this uh, dependency injection library revolve around handling those sticky situations. Now I've, I've read through the user guide and the tutorial. Uh, one nice thing about the tutorial is they have all these little, excuse me, run this code links. So you can click those links and it starts compiling the code and it should run it. I haven't used this remote service before, so I'm not sure how loaded it gets. Assuming this is going to work, um, you should be able to try out any one of these examples and see. It sure is taking a long time to compile. I have a feeling that remote service is either loaded or I can't access it. Um, wow. Okay. We'll just let that go while we keep talking here. So um, you can try these examples. It is a header only library. So uh, if you need, if you want to try it locally, you can just get the one file and um, try any one of these examples by copying and pasting them into a file locally and compiling it yourself. One of the things that they're proud of is their, um, their, their benchmarks. Let's just switch over to that. We give up on there. The remote services trying the compiling. Um, now, because this is a compile time header only library, the benchmarks all are with, with respect to the time it takes to compile. So, as you might imagine, the more distinct types are in your application, if you're using a single injector, that injector is going to have to include the header files for all the types that it's going to know about. And that means including all those header files. That means parsing all those header files, turning them all into compiler internal data structures. And then when all of that is done and you ask the injector to create your main type that represents your whole system, it's going to have to use type deduction to walk its way back through all of the dependencies and um, figure out all the things that it needs to create, which can be a lengthy compile time process. Now, one of the things that their uh, injectors support is you can uh, compose injectors together. So you can have, um, you, you can split things up so that groups of related classes go with one injector, and then that injector is composed with another injector at runtime to, to be able to create uh, even more classes and the composition doesn't need to see the uh, 
definitions of all the the, the classes that it's at at, the, at that point where they're composed at runtime. Uh, sorry, I just noticed a question in the chat, um, and the question was: Is aggregation a, a synonym with composition? And the answer is yes. Um, that was back earlier when we were discussing aggregation versus inheritance. Aggregation just means um, hold the collaborator as a member instead of, de or hold the um, another type as a member variable instead of deriving from the other type. If you want to um, provide a special version of std vector, it's better to hold std vector as a member in your user defined type and then expose all the necessary operations in your user defined type by delegating to calls on the methods of the held member that represents an instance of std vector rather than deriving from std vector. std vector is not intended to be a class that you derive from. Um, and w with these, um, getting back to the injector, because they can be composed together, um, you can break things up into essentially uh, individual factories for clumps of objects, and then you can combine all the factories together, and then that factory can be passed around to anybody that needs to create um, uh, any of the classes known by the subfactories. Uh, so all their benchmarks all revolve around compilation speed and um, the issue here being a compile time library. Um, you don't want to introduce this into your system and then have it cause a huge spike in your build times. I think they've done a pretty good job of addressing that. I haven't uh, drilled into their implementation, but um, it seems like this is something that they've been paying attention to as they develop the library. So it's not something that should you know hit you as a surprise. Um, it is the case that in order to construct concrete objects, you need to parse their headers and see their declarations. And if your headers are transitively including lots of other headers, there's just no way of avoiding that. Uh, I mean, short of restructuring your headers, the you do have to be able to see the full definition of a class and all its methods in order to be able to create an instance of it. That's just normal C++, nothing new here with respect to dependency injection. Um, so in summary, the, the main things that I like about this library are that I don't have to register all my individual types by hand with the dependency injection framework. I may have to give some hints to the dependency injection framework in order to resolve ambiguities, but that's okay. That's far better. A few hints is far better than having to do some work per type in my application, especially if I have a large application. And so that's one good thing is I don't have to do a bunch of registration rigmarole. The other nice thing that I really like about it is using type deduction to transitively deduce all the dependencies of my classes and guarantee that they're all going to be created in the right order. Because um, I've worked on systems where we had to manually create things in the right order and make sure we got it right. Um, and, and that was difficult to maintain. And I like that this library kind of automates that and gets that all out of the way. So that gives you an idea of dependency injection overall and this library in particular. And I like that this library is a single header and it doesn't depend on anything else in Boost. Uh, so I can just grab this one header and bring it into my existing code base without having to drag all 65 libraries or whatever it is in Boost. I like small header-only libraries that I can bring in without having to bring in a lot of library dependencies. Um, it is C++14, which is, you know, could be a little sticky for uh, older code bases, but C++14 is already six years old. And it's uh, with C++20 having just had its uh, final acceptance vote 
and you know probably be it's working its way through the final draft has been voted on it's working its way through to the final acceptance of the standard um that would mean that c plus four c plus plus fourteen is two standard versions behind the current standard once c plus plus twenty is published so that's not too bad in terms of um minimum compiler version requirements are there any questions before we wrap up either through chat or by audio okay well then thanks for listening and i hope you get a sense of how dependency injection can help you in your code and help you test your code more easily. That's the biggest thing that I like about it. And that wraps it up for this month. Nice job, Richard.